House Committee on State Affairs will now come to order to clerk call the roll. Patty. Present. Hernandez. Present. Smithy. We can come back to him. Raymond. Desserto. King. Here. Hunter. Howard. Here. Lucio. Metcalf. Here. Shaheen. Here. Harless. Here. Amen. Slauson. Representative Smithy, can you hear us? He's participating virtually today. Yeah, that's perfect. A quorum is present. As a reminder to all that plan to testify, please ensure that you are registered through the electronic witness affirmation system located on the tablets and hallways throughout the extension. If you are having trouble registering, please see my assistant clerk, Abby, and she will assist you. Please limit your testimony to three minutes. Remember that when you testify in front of our committee, you are testifying under oath and are required to testify fully and truthfully. Today's hearing is also being live streamed on the House website, www.house.texas.gov forward slash video dash audio. Additionally, pursuant to House Rule 4, Section 20B and the standard electronic public comment process established by the Committee on House Administration, all public comments submitted through the period through the portal will be posted on TLST TLO and the House website after the comment period is closed. Directions on how to <clears throat> submit public comments, <clears throat> pardon me, on the portal can be found on today's hearing notice. The public comments portal have been uh, has been open since October 3rd and will close upon adjournment of this hearing. Uh, with that, members, the chair lays out Senate Bill 5 by Senator Lucio and recognizes Representative Patterson to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm sorry to drag y'all back on a Tuesday uh, for this, but I assure you today will be well worth your time. Um, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to lay out Senate Bill 5, also known as the Safe Outdoor Dogs Act, before this committee. In 2007, House Bill 1411 was passed by the 80th legislature to address the unlawful restraint of a dog by establishing a standard of care dog owners are required to adhere to today, current law. This can be found in Chapter 821, Subchapter D of the Health and Safety Code. Unfortunately, this law includes a provision that requires officers to provide owners with a 24-hour notice, which effectively renders the bill or the law unenforceable. If a dog is suffering in a harsh environment, extremely whole, uh, hot or cold temperatures, it's likely uh, that, they'll, that they'll either be in critical, critical condition or dead if action is not immediately taken. We don't really always have 24 hours in those conditions. This bill prohibits the use of weights and chains and improperly fitted collars. One of our witnesses will be providing you with several pictures demonstrating why this change is necessary to the current law. Aside from those two changes, clarifying language um, and ensuring owners provide tethered dogs with certain necessities, such as adequate shelter and water, Senate Bill 5 is nearly identical to current law other than those. As you are well aware, uh, the Safe Outdoor Dogs Act passed during the regular session as Senate Bill 474, I believe it had 32 no votes on third reading on the House floor. However, due to certain issues, it was ultimately vetoed by Governor Abbott. Now, thankfully, he's given the legislature a second chance on this bill to address a few issues. Um, to address the, the items in the governor's veto proclamation, this bill defines inclement weather, just clarifies that, removes the words, quote, in a manner that does not allow for an escape from the definition of properly fitted uh, collars, as we felt that was repetitive, um, changes that a dog must be able to avoid feces and urine to excessive animal waste um, to make sure that we're really drilling down into what the real issue on that uh, is. Um, and then removes a harness, must not, quote, cause pain or injury to the dog, as again, that was repetitive to other language in the bill. Uh, for the exception of a dog in a truck bed, the word reasonably was added to, quote, time necessary for the owner to complete a temporary task. So now it reads, quote, a dog left unattended in an open air truck bed only for the time reasonably necessary for the owner to complete a temporary task. 
All exceptions uh, from the bill that passed during the regular session are included, which there are seven pretty big ex exceptions uh, in, located in this bill. Uh, they are exceptions that protect owners who are hunting, ranching, engaged in a temporary activity, walking their dog and more uh, from being prosecuted under this law. Again, I want to stress that uh, what we are seeking to do here is not new. I mean, really, this is all current law. We're just simply repealing subchapter D and inputting something that's far more, uh, provides far more clarity to law enforcement. Mr. Chairman and members, thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Members, any questions for Mr. Patterson at this time? If not, we'll reserve your right to close and proceed to testimony. Thank you. Chair calls Ziggy Agent. Kind of pull that microphone down a little bit so we can hear you. And uh, if you would state your name and who you represent and your position on the bill. Uh, my name is Ziggy Agin. I'm a junior adv advocate for the Texas Humane Legislation Network. And I came, I came here from Dallas, Texas to talk about the Safe Outdoor Dogs Bill. All right. You're rushing. And you're for the bill, correct? Wait, what? Uh, yes, yes. Bill. Okay, great. We rescued my dog Fern from the Houston Humane Society. They seized her from a dog fighting ring where they used dogs to fight for money, which is illegal. When they found her, she was skinny, bruised, covered in fleas, had no food or water, and was tied to a big chain uh, like this one. We took her home the day after Thanksgiving, and I wanted to play with her, but my parents told me she didn't trust humans yet, so I had to wait. Now uh, she zooms around the backyard and is a lot more trusting. This proves with a good amount of the, a good amount of shelter and the right amount of love, all, any scar on a dog will heal. So uh, Abraham Lincoln was the first president to step up for animal rights. Uh, when kids tor tortured animals by putting hot coals on their backs, he told them to st uh, stop because it was inhumane, and cruel and inhumane to torture defenseless animals. And a guide dog named Rochelle named Rochelle, uh, saved her owner and others by taking them down countless flights of stairs during 9-11. So, and a hero dog named Rags saved his troops during World War I. Uh, some of the world's greatest heroes are dogs, so, we uh, so why do we treat them so poorly? With the Safe Outdoor Dogs Bill Act, we could, we could uh, help, dogs by help dogs that live outside by uh, giving them food, water, and shelter and um, making sure they get rid of heavy chains. Thank you for your time. All right. <clears throat> Members, any questions for this outstanding witness this morning? Good job, buddy. Great, Great job, Ziggy. Thank you. Chair calls Rick Briscoe. Good morning, sir. You would state your name, who you represent, and your position on the bill, please. Yes, sir. My name is Rick Briscoe. I am representing myself and my dog, Travis. And you are for the bill? Correct? I am for the bill, yes, sir. Okay. This is Travis. I am his human. Travis was severely neglected. He's 10 years old. He was chained in a, a backyard, had no place to lie but hard ground. He tried to chew through the chain, and so most of his teeth are broken and infected. He's had to go through dental surgery to deal with that. Um, his coat was matted, dirty, and just general mess. Um, you'll notice I had to hold him. Travis is camera shy. This is Travis enjoying roaming freely about his yard now that he's no longer constrained by a chain. And here he is having a little fun. He's entitled a little bit. Travis is 10 years old, was left essentially unattended for most of his life. Um, uh, it defies my imagination how someone could mistreat such a fine dog. I'm speaking for him and many other dogs similarly situated because they deserve better. It is our hope that this bill and the publicity surrounding it will make people aware of their responsibilities that if they choose to have a dog, they must care for it appropriately. And if they cannot, 
arrange for it to be adopted by someone who will. And I, I thank you for your attention and urge your support of this bill. Members, any questions for Mr. Briscoe? Thank you, sir. Chair calls Brian Hawthorne. Morning, sir. Good morning, Chairman. Members, uh, I'm Brian Hawthorne. I'm the Sheriff of Chambers County, and I'm here on behalf of the 254 sheriffs from the Sheriff's Association of Texas. We support this bill. We support the changes uh, that the governor had uh, requested. We think the, uh, the changes are very reasonable. The bill is still very effective. This is our third session for the Sheriff's Association of Texas to support this bill. We were excited to see it get past the finish line only to uh, have some uh, changes moved to it. We like the changes, so we're hoping that this time it can actually get to the goal line. Um, I will tell you that uh, this gives sheriffs and constables uh, and law enforcement that are outside of the incorporated city, it gives us the ability to have some, some teeth to protect animals. Um, currently, state law has a, a lot of uh, missing sections in it that will help uh, police officers uh, protect dogs, especially. The, uh, the bill has really good exemptions for sporting dogs and working dogs. Uh, I myself uh, have, I'm a sporting dog enthusiast. I have dogs that uh, are involved in field trials and all those protections that sporting dog enthusiasts and working dogs, such as cattle dogs, herding dogs, uh, all those protections are in this bill. So we think it's a very good bill. So I will tell you on the behalf of the Sheriff's Association of Texas, we ask you to support this bill for your county sheriff and also for Ziggy, who's gonna be the next president of PETA. <laughs> Right. Chairman, and, thank you. And, and Sheriff, just, just to be clear, you're representing Sheriff's Association of Texas and yourself. And myself, yes, uh, sir. For the bill. All right. Yes. Members, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for being here this morning. So in the previous session where this was taken up, did y'all support that version of the bill as well? Yes, we did. Okay. Yes, we did. But you like this version better? Is that, do I, I, I like the bill. That I like the bill that's going to get across the finish line. <laughs> okay. All right. This, this really is a very important bill. Um, and I, I myself, because I, I'm in a hurricane area, and then obviously we all realize what happened with the, uh, the freeze. There were a, a number of issues that took place with animals that would have been very beneficial to us if we would have had this bill. And it's not for the ability to go out and write people tickets. It's for the ability to encourage people to take care of their animals. And that's where this bill really comes into, into play, is the ability to educate and encourage more than enforce. Can you, I'm a rural Texas girl, Sheriff. Absolutely. Can you tell me um, if, if it is unanimous within your organization in more rural areas, how your sheriffs may feel about that? So I would say that you would probably find, um, we're, there's 254 of us. Mm -hmm. I would say that you'd have well over 200 that are as compassionate about this bill as the Board of Directors is. And you may have some in certain rural areas that, that may feel um, the bill uh, could be a little overreaching, but we feel like the bill is those things that could have been construed as overreaching, we do not believe are in the bill anymore. Uh, and, and, and honestly, we cannot come up with any reason from a sheriff's association why anybody, whether it's a sheriff or a state legislator, wouldn't see that this bill is very reasonable and protection of animals. The, it, it gives that sporting dog enthusiast, it gives the hunter, it gives the cattle rancher, the sheep rancher, the ability to, to utilize and use his dog the way it was intended, but to make sure that dogs are not being abused, which most ranchers and hunters don't abuse their dogs. It's the people that have this animal for the purpose of Nobody really knows unless you're the meth dealer that wants the pit bulls in the front yard. Um, uh, we, we, we cannot come up with any reason to not support this bill. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I appreciate your time. You bet. Members, any other questions? Thank you, Sheriff. No, no, thank you, Chairman. Chair calls Misty Valenta. Good morning. Good morning. 
My name is Misty Valenta. Uh, I am the Animal Services Director for the Williamson County Regional Animal Shelter, and I am for this bill. And for the record, uh, Misty, you're representing the Williamson County Regional Animal Shelter and yourself. Yes. In favor of the bill. All yes, right. sir. Perfect. Um, I support this bill, which will ensure dogs have adequate shelter, be protected from chains, and allow mistreated, suffering dogs to be saved immediately without a 24-hour waiting period. On average, the Williamson County Regional Animal Shelter serves 7,000 animals a year. Though we assist several thousand a year, there are two dogs whose stories remain with me to this day. And I have pictures of these stories, if you would like to see. They're attached here. One is Atlas. He's a bouncy nine-month-old puppy. He came in with a collar embedded halfway around his neck. Not only was Atlas enduring the constant pain of a collar splitting the skin around his throat, he also had a carabiner clip weighing over one pound hanging from a portion of the collar. This effectively served as a weight around the puppy's neck. After removing the collar and the added weight from the clip, Atlas had a 1.5 centimeter laceration around half of his neck. The wound was excreting plasma and pus, indicating this was a long-term open injury. If Atlas had a properly fitted collar and had been tethered to material that did not require the weight of a 1.2 pound weighted clip, he would never have to go through such suffering. The second story is Coco, a three-year-old black and white border collie. Animal control had been alerted to Coco. She was tethered to a tree, which served as her shelter during all weather conditions. Upon inspection, the officer learned that Coco had lived her entire three years of life under that tree. And because of the 24-hour waiting period, Listed in the current state law, the officer had to get the owner to surrender Coco to assist her. Once the officer had Coco, it was clear she was in need of medical care. Coco was tethered to a tree with a zip tie as her collar, which had grown into her neck. This resulted in a 14 centimeter wound halfway around her neck. After the zip tie had been removed and the laceration was cleaned, Coco had to have staples placed across her throat to keep her skin together. If Coco had been wearing a proper collar that could be resized easily and a proper shelter to keep her safe from the elements, she wouldn't have to endure, endure such pain. Each of these cases required the use of taxpayer dollars in terms of employee time, assessing, cleaning, performing hydrotherapy, and fundraising for donations for outside veterinary care, all of which are limited resources. Resources that did not have to be used if these dogs were never allowed to live in such circumstances. I am proud that our community is full of animal lovers who also agree that animals should not suffer. The city of Round Rock, one of the jurisdictions served by my shelter, has already passed mus municipal ordinances which clearly define collars, shelters, and banned chains from being used to tether a dog. It is heartbreaking to know that a dog may be suffering in another jurisdiction because these compassionate updates to the code have not been passed statewide. Please follow suit with the community of Round Rock and pass SB5. Thank you so much for your time. Members, any questions? Thank you for being Thank here you. this morning. Chair calls Morgan Spencer. Good morning, Ms. Spencer. If you would state your name, who you represent, and your position on the bill, please. I am Morgan Spencer. I am the supervisor for the Williamson County Sheriff's Office Animal Control Unit. I am in favor of Senate Bill 5. I represent the Williamson County Sheriff's Office and myself. I just have you as Williamson County Sheriff's Office, so is that okay? That's all right. Okay. Thank you. We're all together. All right. I am in favor of uh, Senate Bill 5. I've been in a position in animal control for a few years here. 
I have worked with municipalities as City of Round Rock supervisor of their animal control unit, as well as the county now as their supervisor for animal control unit, which is a vast difference in the ordinances versus the state law that we can now enforce. My personal opinion, City of Round Rock has much more enforceable ordinances and the animals are safer in that city versus what I can now do in the county. The vast difference is, is something that I've experienced firsthand and I would welcome any questions regarding that towards the end of my testimony. There's a section of the Health and Safety Code 821 as it exists today that references water. I have come across citizens that call our sheriff's office for assistance asking for us to check the welfare of the animals of their neighbor's dog or animals that they have come across in their, in their path. When I get there, there's water provided, but it has fecal matter in it. It has urine in it. It has bacteria and it's contaminated. And I have to explain to these people that Texas, the state of Texas is okay with this. I would not feed that or give that to my animals and I'm sure none of you would either. But unfortunately, as health and safety code exists today, chapter 821, when it discusses water, it doesn't say potable water or drinkable water. It just says water. So I cannot enforce anything specific if there is fecal matter in the, or urine in this contaminated water provided to the animals. Um, in the city of Round Rock, they do have the word potable in their definition, which is an extreme difference on what they can do versus what I can do. Um, also, I'm going to describe kind of a graphic situation. I also have a written testimony here with photographs of a situation that in, involves the penalty section of 821 when it comes to restraint of animals. Restraint of animals underneath the penalty as it exists currently with Health and Safety Code 821, it says that I have to give them a 24-hour written warning or an educational moment. And I understand the intent behind that, which is we never, even today with other laws, we do not want to go in and write citations and take anybody's animals. That's not our agenda. We want to definitely public educate. We want to get voluntary compliance where we can. Specific situation includes there's a male and a female that had a verbal disturbance. This happened last month in Williamson County. The officers arrived, separated the parties. The male decided he would go to a hotel, and the female decided to stay at her home and care for their dog, Ava. Ava is a military uh, emotional support animal that belongs to the male party, who is a U.S. military veteran. Eight days later, he calls me and says she's killed my dog. I follow up with officers. I go to the home, we investigate. And what it comes down to is she confesses on body camera with me that she intentionally tied this animal out on a four foot leash with a pinch collar. Pinch collars are used to restrain and constrict the neck of an animal during training and you pull it swiftly. You don't tie them out with it. As health and, health and safety code exists today, I had to give her a 24 hour waiting period. This animal ended up dying. It had wrapped itself trying to get out of the heat where she tied it up. It was in the back of the yard, unfortunately, on a very short stake. It ended up being a four foot tether with the, the pinch collar that did penetrate her neck, causing multiple puncture wounds. Ava had indentions on her body, which are in these photos that are semi-graphic. So I want to warn you about those before you read them or see them. And I had to give her a warning. She intentionally did it. Um, Ava ended up struggling and, and, and passed away based on the type of tether that she had. What I ask is that we update this penalty section for situations like these. And this is not just a single incident. This is one of many that me in the field, having enforcing this chapter 821 as it exists today, I feel would benefit greatly from being upgraded. Thank you for letting me come here. And I appreciate all your time and letting me share those stories with you. Members, any questions? Thank you. I have another question. Sure. So I heard you mention that you deal not just with dogs in this regard, but other animals out there. So this bill, as you know, is specifically addressing dogs. Yes. Do you anticipate trying to bring about changes to address other livestock, other animals, other situations you see? Absolutely. And those are going to be in the form of county ordinances that we've been working on for a long time. So they're much similar to what this Senate Bill 5 is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so if this Senate Bill 5, 5 passes, I'm going to greatly, you know, change the way our ordinance are, are sent up for proposal now. But yes, absolutely. The way that they restrain animals um, in general, there's some other, other concerns we have, but specific to dogs, it's, this is the first step of many. May I ask what is the, if there is a current consequence for the, for the person who um, brought about the demise of Ava? So for that specific scenario, I reached out to the Liberty Hill Police Department because there is a section underneath penal code for cruelty to non-livestock that can be processed. I am not a peace officer, so on an animal control level, I can only handle health and safety code and, and enforce that one. Peace officers can take my case, which they have done 
and, and forcefully. They, uh, well, they have a warrant for her arrest for what happened to Ava. So the difference here is just essentially that 24 hour? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Because, you know, it, we could use it as a bargaining tool, especially when we go to court as some kind of a, if there was not a 24 hour waiting period and there was a citation, mm -hmm. there could be some kind of downplay and play with, with some kind of pretrial PTIP, with pretrial intervention programs or anything like that that she could use there. Okay. So having a 24 hour waiting period is a little relaxed compared to what it could be. Thank you very much. Members, any other questions? Ms. Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first off, I see that we do have in this bill potable water, so that is listed. Thank you. Yes, uh, but you mentioned earlier in your testimony that uh, you would like to be able to give us some uh, examples of the differences in what happens in the local municipality versus the county. So would you like to share that? Yes, absolutely. So I was the supervisor for the city of Round Rock. I actually submitted a, um, a handful of ordinances up that got passed specifically to dangerous animals. But in regards to potable water, when I would approach a home and I would see the fecal matter in the um, water, I would see feces covered in the area. These animals, I would you know, we would always start, I'll just say this, we'll always start with public education. We never want to take animals. We never want to write citations. So we would always start with, um, hey, let me tell you how to clean this water or give your animal clean water. Um, there was an offense for that. It was a citable offense, class C misdemeanor. We don't have to have, as the current um, Health and Safety Code 821 indicates, we don't have to have a mandated line that says I have to give a warning for that. So Round Rock, the city ordinance has made that a higher charge, a city a class C misdemeanor. And we could issue it day one to anybody that has water that's not drinkable, water that's not potable. And so being in the county, I would have to, the difference is now if I come across that same scenario in Round Rock, we could change it right away. And we can cite them if they refuse to give the clean water. In the county, I feel the animals are not that safe because if they tell me, go fly a kite, Morgan, we're not gonna do that. I can't do anything for 24 hours and that animal has to, to stay with the nasty water that it was delivered to by its owner. Um, I feel that, honestly, the, the differences that I'm experiencing working from a city with stronger ordinances and a county is counties are, are not as protected. These animals are not as protected as, especially from the city of Round Rock differences, but, and it's heartbreaking. But, but would you not agree that this bill improves that situation? Absolutely, in the county? absolutely. We you do. You will still see differences, though. I'm assuming big time. Yes, and I think public education for what does the word potable mean? Because I, I understand that's a very strong word, maybe for lack of a better term. And there's maybe some people that don't understand it. So what myself and, and Miss Valenta do, we work hand in hand with the shelter, and we make flyers for for people, for public education, for different programs that we've helped for. Um, people that are low income. You know, we, we definitely have, have worked together on a few projects where we can implement something like this. When the house, hopefully, when everybody passes this, we would definitely have an education moment where we could provide flyers for public education on what the changes are. So um, this is probably gonna be for the author, but there's nothing in the bill that, that does affect the local regulations right now, is that correct? And I can talk to him later. I mean, as far as you know, right? As far as I know, they, right. they will not conflict. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Spencer. Thank you. <clears throat> Chair calls Bella Bergen. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, now tearing up the equipment. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All right, my name is Bella Bergen. I'm representing Texas Humane Legislation Network, and, and I am in favor of Senate Bill 5. And yourself as well, correct? Yes, sir. All right, perfect. Hello, and thank you for your time today. My name is Bella. I'm 14 years old and, for the, and have spent the past six years of my life championing this bill alongside the Texas Humane Legislation Network. When I do the math, that equates to over 40% of my lifetime as a stakeholder in this action. So let's get down to business. Over the past six years, support for right-sizing the 2007 tethering law has grown exponentially. The Safe Outdoor Dogs Act of today 
filed as Senate Bill 474 and HB 873 isn't a new law. It simply fixes the current broken law. 100 Texas lawmakers united as co-sponsors of Senate Bill 474 as a solid fix to a broken law. SB 474 passed in the House 83 to 32 and the Senate 28 to 3 with wide bipartisan support. The THLN team was ecstatic when this bill was sent to the governor for signature, but y'all know what happened after that. A few years ago, I worked closely with Mayor Morgan and Police Chief Banks to pass an anti-tethering ordinance for the city of Round Rock. The city of Taylor followed to leverage the same common sense language. I can count another 40 cities with similar ordinances. We've demonstrated support across 40 plus cities in the state of Texas. We've demonstrated bipartisan support across the House and Senate. We've demonstrated the support of respected statewide organizations and stakeholders. We've landed here in special session and have demonstrated validity. Lastly, historical weather, historical Texas weather earlier this year demonstrated an imminent need for this legislative action. Remember Snowvid and what that meant for dogs living outdoors on chains without access to food, water, or shelter. This bill is important for the well-being of animals in our care. We must enact change. This bill is important for the safety of our communities. We as a society as a society, the way we treat animals is indicative of the way we treat children and the elderly. We must protect the powerless. In summary, I'm standing here today to ensure that SB 5 passes through the House and is finally and proudly signed into Texas state law. I respectfully and powerfully ask each of you to join me in this action. Thank you. Members, any questions for Bella? Awesome job. Thank you very much. Yeah, great job. Members, we may see Bella up in this dais here. One, one of these. Uh, so, great testimony. Chair calls Tina Faust. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, everybody. Representative Harless, thank you for letting us be here. Um, you could pull that microphone up just a little bit. There you go. Thank you, Chair and members, for your consideration in hearing on this very real life-saving bill. My name is Tina Lundquist Faust, and I'm testifying in support of SB5. I'm testifying on behalf of Houston PetSet and myself. I've had the privilege of serving as co-president of Houston PetSet for the last nine years. We're a 17-year-old 501c3 nonprofit with the mission to end the homelessness and suffering of companion animals. Since 2020 alone, our organization has contributed, contributed to more than 3,000 free spays and neuters, transported more than 2,500 pets to forever homes across state lines, and we have partnered with local municipalities to shore up resources when needed. In addition to our programs, we grant operating dollars to 70 plus local animal welfare nonprofits in the Houston area that work to save chained and suffering dogs throughout the city. In other words, we help fund the people in the trenches, the people that rescue, spay, neuter, foster, adopt, and go above and beyond to save Houston's forgotten animals. To date, we've granted more than $3 million to these important organizations. I traveled from Houston to testify today because now more than ever, we need to fix the statewide tethering law that is currently unenforceable. Dog suffering on the ends of heavy chains is the number one concern of our rescue partners every day. Last summer, we encountered a dog whose chain was on a run, allowing him to travel between two trees. The chain was legally long enough, just long enough to let the dog run back and forth, but it didn't allow him to sit or to lie down. The dog was forced to stand for 24 hours a day. Watching the video cam of it was horrible. When he tried to lie down, he would strangle himself. The current law did not protect this dog. Right now in the state of Texas, it is legal and permissible to use a heavy chain as a means to restrain a dog. 
chains so heavy the dogs can become injured and even deformed from carrying the weight of these chains. SB 5 would also define shelter for dogs. During the February storms in Texas, we saw firsthand the consequences of our unenforceable laws. In Houston, the law enforcement switchboard crashed when more than 5,000 calls were reported. Um, those were on call, dogs that were chained up in the cold. We don't know how many calls would have been recorded had the switchboard not failed. So many dogs froze to death on the ends of chains that week because the current law did not protect them. In summary, we need a law that requires dogs to have access to shade and protective shelter. Houston also needs to end the use of chains as a method of restraint. Thank you for allowing me to testify today on behalf of the animals of Houston. Members, any questions? Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. Chair calls Tama Lundquist. Uh, next up will be uh, Stacy Kirby, and that is the last person we have registered to testify. So if you would like to testify, we would encourage you to sign up very quickly, if you would, please. Thank you for being here this morning. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, committee members, my name is Tama Lundquist, and I'm testifying in support of SB 5 on behalf of myself and Houston Pet Set, of which I'm co-president. Houston Pet Set, through our partnerships, research, events, and grants, is already helping tens of thousands of homeless pets avoid being killed every year by placing them in new loving homes. It's part of our mission to elevate the status of companion animals in our community. In our local efforts, Houston Pet Set, in partnership with other organizations and law enforcement agencies, created the Harris County Animal Cruelty Task Force wherein we created one central location where animal cruelty could be reported. Of the tens of thousands of individuals who called our task force hotline, cruel and unsafe tethering was one of the most reported concerns. However, and unfortunately, there was nothing that could be done for these dogs because the statewide tethering statute was unenforceable. Since 2015, Houston stakeholders and countless Texans have been working to pass this bill to clarify the existing outdoor restraint statute, which in its current state is so vague that it's completely unenforceable. When Houston Pet Set helped create the Harris County Animal Cruelty Task Force, we became very aware of these unenforceable laws. While the community embraced the hotline and reported thousands of cases every month, the frustrations rose. The law enforcement agents often could not help the neglected and suffering animals. They did not have the laws to support what they wanted to do, and that was save these animals. The community was equally frustrated. Why were they calling and not seeing the dogs rescued or put and put into better situations? It became apparent to us that this law needed to be changed. We are here today because while Houston Pet Set increases the awareness of animal welfare programs, in, er, increases the problems in Houston, we want to encourage our elected officials to get involved as well. We are proud to say that every single Houston legislator either co-offered the Safe Outdoor Dog Act or voted in favor of it. They did so because they understand that unsafe tethering is one of the city's biggest issues. Before I conclude, in, in 2021, during February's extreme winter storm, our rescuers were inundated with calls of citizens trying to save dogs left outside to freeze and suffer. They did not have shelter, and many of these dogs ultimately suffered terrible fates. They died because the current broken statute prevented what could have been a life-saving intervention. In summary, Houston citizens and those who dedicate their life to animal welfare causes need the Safe Outdoor Dog Act to pass because it establishes just the basic standard of shelter and care for dogs left outdoors, and it clarifies the existing law to promote the safety of animals and the people around them. Thank you so much for your time and for letting, allowing us to be here. Members, any questions? Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Chair calls Stacy Kirby. And again, Ms. Kirby is the last witness that is registered to testify. So if you would like to testify, you have. Thank you, Chair. Do that very quickly, please. Thank you yes. for being here this morning. 
Good morning, Chair and members. My name is Stacy Sutton Kirby. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Texas Humane Legislation Network. We're a 45 year old nonprofit that is devoted to passing common sense, mainstream animal welfare policy in Texas uh, with a state of nearly 30 million people, 254 counties, and rural and urban folks. We take all those stakeholders to the table, and uh, we've been on a very long journey, six years, to pass this bill. Um, I really just came up to address a point made earlier, a uh, very valid question about who all does this, uh, what animals are affected by this. This is under the section of the code 821.076 uh, that is the unlawful restraint of a dog. It doesn't affect any livestock. It doesn't affect any other animals. And it only empowers officers to intervene with regard to the unsafe restraint of a dog. And that was uh, something I wanted to make clear to this body this morning. And for the record, Ms. Kirby, you're for the bill. <laughs> yes. <laughs> was in a hurry, sir. <laughs> uh, okay. That's okay. Members, any questions? Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Is there anyone else wish to speak on for or against the bill? If not, the chair recognizes Representative Patterson to close on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, <clears throat> I want to be very clear. You know, this bill's four or five pages, and a big section of the bill is what the bill's not doing. And I think that those exceptions are largely due to negotiations over time before I took the baton on this bill, you know, work that others have done to try to work out a solution that worked for rural Texas and urban Texas and suburban Texas um, all the same. And so um, I've just asked that you take, you know, look at those exceptions. Um, I grew up in rural Texas. I grew up with cattle and two dogs outside. Um, you had 83 people in my high school class. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not some city slicker trying to come in here and tell rural Texas what to do with their dogs. I can assure you of that. Um, and we're not even talking about untethered dogs. We're not even talking about tethered dogs while you're there. We're only talking about tethered dogs unattended. And so that's kind of the main main thing with this bill. Um, to, to answer uh, um, one of the questions on page four of the bill toward the bottom, um, Ms. Howard, I believe you asked about does this preempt any local regulation? And it does not. Um, as long as it is equal to or more uh, than what this bill allows for. And I know that there are a couple of, local, uh, of local cities uh, that have adopted something very similar to what this bill uh, ultimately would be if it, were, if it were law. But I'd be happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Members in question. Mr. Harless. Just for clarity, because I got a bunch of calls to my office. Dogs are still going to be required to be on a leash in public places, correct? This would not affect that. And we don't have to worry about people letting their pit bulls run freely in their front yard, correct? That's one of the main reasons why in 2007 the original law was one of the reasons why that law was put in place in 2007. So we don't have to worry about that. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Members, any questions? Mr. Patterson. Ms. Lawson. Yes, thank you. So as it is right now, a municipality or a county could pass regulations or ordinances doing exactly what this bill does. Yeah, just like any other law that we pass here um, in the state legislature, a city or a county likely has the authority to do that locally as well. And so some have, like Round Rock, and others have elected not to do so, perhaps because they don't find it to be a need within their particular community. I couldn't, I couldn't guess as to why they haven't. Okay. One of the things that I hear, and you and I have talked about this, and I really appreciate the conversations that we've had on it, is <clears throat> the concern that in rural Texas, we respect our animals. Our animals are integral to our way of life, to our families. They're often <clears throat> viewed as members of our families, and we have a very low regard for people who would mistreat them. Mm -hmm. um, so it is not a question of whether or not um, a dog, a cat, <laughs> Shane uh, <clears throat> is worthy of um, protection and due regard. It, it's a question for us about what's the proper role of government mm -hmm. in that. And when I when I hear um, the potential that some places may wish to expand upon this to cover other animals or livestock, and I, I recognize this bill only addresses dogs. Those are the kind of things that get 
feedback from my district out of concern. So. I, I absolutely respect that. I, I would suggest that, um, you know, I grew up with cattle. We, we never tethered our cattle. <clears throat> Show steers, we would, we would tether uh, while we were working with the steer. Um, but, you know, there aren't many examples of animals that are left tethered unattended for long periods of time uh, without adequate food or shelter. And though this bill specifically addresses dogs, I would say any, any animal that is put through pain and tethered uh, while unattended like that, you know, probably shouldn't be. But that's not for me to decide right now. For all I'm trying to decide here and that we are as a legislature trying to decide is what happens with our dogs. Um, and in terms of the role of government, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, that's obviously a concern of mine as well. But most of what's here is already law. It's already law in the books. I mean, I'm literally repealing an entire section and replacing it with better definitions to help clarify the law for people. So it's not that we're adding a bunch of new laws to the books. We're simply clarifying and giving more opportunities for law enforcement to work with people and to educate them by removing that 24-hour notice so that they can get to that animal that may be suffering sooner. Um, so um, I would share that concern about this specific bill if we were implementing a new section of code, but we're just simply not doing that. I mean, it's already the law. We're just clarifying it. Now, this, wouldn't, this bill wouldn't prohibit an officer giving notice to someone of a potential violation, correct? That's absolutely right. And look, I mean, you're a big fan of law enforcement, as am I. And I think that one of the things that our law enforcement officers do best, um, you know, even when they pull over someone for violating, you know, speed limit, is, you know, sometimes they take the opportunity to educate, to warn, and all that. Sometimes they give you a ticket. You know, it's their discretion. And I think it would be the same thing here, where, you know, that Class C misdemeanor would be a discretion of the officer to, to hand out or not. Thank you, I appreciate Thank you. it. Yes, ma'am. Members, any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Thank you, sir. Um, members, uh, we advised your office prior to the meeting that it was the chair's intention not only to hear this bill today, but to go ahead and uh, vote it out. And so does anyone have any questions or concerns about that? All right. Chair moves that Senate Bill 5 without amendments be reported to the full House with a recommendation that it do pass and be printed. The clerk call the roll. Patty. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. Smithy. Desotel. King. Aye. Raymond. Hunter. Howard. Aye. Lucio. Metcalf. Yes. Shaheen. Aye. Harless. Yes. Slauson. No. Seven. Seven eyes. One no. There being seven ayes, one no, uh, five absent, the motion prevails. Thanks again to everyone for their participation in today's hearing. Is there any business left to be discussed? If nothing further. That concludes our business for today. If there is no objection, the Committee on State Affairs will stand adjourned subject to the call to air. Call the chair. Okay. Chair, here's no objection. Yeah, the Committee on State Affairs is now adjourned.